Good morning. My name is Michael. I'm from Virginia. I um, was born in Laurel, Maryland. We were there for three years, then we moved into West Virginia for uh, three years. Then when I was in second grade, we moved to Virginia, and I've lived here ever since. I was brought up, and my mother was a teacher. My father was a farmer and construction worker. I um, work, he, we were taught to work hard on the farm and to, uh, to uh, earn our keep, I guess would be a good way of saying it. When I was 15 years old, I um, had my driver's license and all my friends in high school, all my buddies, they drank beer. So every Friday and Saturday night, we were out drinking beer and uh, pretty heavily, actually. It's a miracle through the grace and mercy of God that I didn't kill somebody or even get killed. And um, in 1968, I graduated from high school. I, I was in Virginia Tech for a year and a half. The draft system, lottery system came in. I um, wasn't doing very good in school. I was still drinking beer. So I ended up being put on probation. My draft number was 157. So in January, February of 1970, I called the draft board and I said, "How's uh, how is 157 doing?" And she said, "You're number two to go next month." So I said, "Don't bother mailing that. I'm going. In, I'm enlisting tomorrow." So in May of 1970, I was uh, ta- sworn in at, to the United States Air Force. Went through boot camp, tech school, etc. I had gotten married in the early end, right after uh, boot camp, because of, uh, let us just say, I was immature. I was under a spirit of rejection to start with and under a spirit of lust heavily since I was about five years old. So I was always focused on women. It didn't matter. From the time I was five, I was focused on somebody or some younger, not younger than myself, but young, you know, my age or even teachers that were teaching me in school, which was a heavy burden and caused a lot of um, missteps in my life. Amen. So I, I got married and my wife was not a faithful woman to me. I mean, we drank and partied with other servicemen. And when she drank, she became flirtatious and overboard sometimes even with that. So that caused me a lot more rejection. And it came to a point of... um her affections denied to me, drew me into adultery. So that went went along for, let's see, 1970 to 1986. I was in that kind of a relationship with my first wife. So um, we got into an argument. I moved out of the house. That was our, so we were split up and I was um, chasing anything that I could is what it amounted to. I was quite um, I think the Bible calls it whoremonger, so I'll just admit to that label. And then I remarried another woman. Both of my first wife and my second wives I met in a bar room. Okay, so that that's how those two relationships started. And the second, uh, the second woman also suffered from rejection, and I would call her a Jezebel spirit in that I firmly believe that the devil sent her into my life to kill and destroy me, but God had grace and mercy upon me and kept me safe. I mean, it was even to the point of I I was a butcher, so I had a long knife that's used for breaking beef, and I had a chef, long chef knife at home. And so previously to that, she had said my drinking was causing all these problems, so I just quit right on the spot, didn't drink anymore. And um, she came home one night and she'd been drinking and she picked up both of those knives and had one in the air, the long one in the air like that and the chef's knife four inches from my chest and she was raging and I thought, Lord, I didn't try to, I didn't argue, I didn't do any of this. I depended on God to protect me through that and then it, that's the way it turned out. There was no more violence about it than that. But, um, and I'm not 
blaming her for my life, even though, because I was the Ahab. I was always trying to please. And when that didn't work out, that's even more rejection. So in my spirit, so the, um, it, you know, she demanded that I move out and God moved me to a isolated farmhouse out in the country. And all I did when I got there was read the word of God and watch biblical themed movies, but I didn't watch television. I didn't, I didn't enter, um, play sports or do anything. Um, I was really into the word of God. Amen. And to get to before previous to this, before we were divorced and separated, I had a Christian brother from Guatemala who worked for me in the in my business. And, he, and I just want to tell people, when you see a person's face in distress, they are in distress. You, you cannot, you can smile and you can even half-heartedly laugh, but you cannot veil it if you know, if a person knows what they're looking for or look discerning the spirit that's in you. So he came to me one day and he said, Brother Michael, and I certainly wasn't his brother. I was as heathen as it could get. I was just old and older, 50 years, 49 years old, and I was feeling destroyed. And a year previous to that, and I was feeling very down and beaten and hopeless and rejected. I said, made the statement, I'm going to give this God thing a try. That's if you listen to what I just said, that means I knew absolutely nothing about Jesus or anything, but I knew a few people involved that were uh, Christians, not churchgoers, but Christians. And the so I guess that seed came from there. And obviously, I'll have to also say, I'm sure I had people praying for me. Amen. The power of prayer cannot be resisted. So the, and God is faithful. Amen. So he comes to me and he says, uh, brother Michael, I read Psalm 91 every day before I come to work. And so I'm grasping at a straws because I'm, I'm off and on contemplating suicide because of what's going on in my life. I was hopeless and I was, uh, rejected. So I had no hope and I, in despair, meaning nothing I tried to do at work or anything else gave me any relief from the wickedness that was coming against me. Again, I'm responsible for all of my life. No woman or no man made me walk the way I walked. I did it on my own. Amen. So the, um, I started reading Psalm 91 every day and it, it was like God gave me faith that that was written just for me. Amen. And he gave me faith to believe it. Like, uh, he who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God in him. I shall trust. Amen. And so, and it goes on to, I'm not going to quote the whole Psalm. Obviously I encourage you to read it and believe it in whatever circumstance to me, that's the most complete um, Psalm in the Bible. I mean, it gives you protection, gives you a place of peace. It gives you the um, promise that he is going to lead you through so that you don't dash your foot against the stone and uh, will tread upon serpents and cobras and the lion shall not overtake us. And that lion is not Judah. It is the devil who is there seeking to kill and destroy who he may. And he almost got me. Because um, uh, I was very much contemplating suicide in my home, away from home at that time. And um, suicide, as far as, as my experience, is this. It's hopelessness and it's despair that it's never going to change and there's no way out of it. But God called me out of that when I had, I had my nine millimeter in my hand and I was very heavily contemplating carrying through. And God called me out of that. He didn't appear in front of me. He didn't speak to me, but the spirit led me away from that. Amen. And when I contemplated, um, whenever that wasn't the only time that ever came across my mind, even when I started and had surrendered to the Lord, the, the reason I call it a spirit of the devil 
well, it's the spirit of death. You take your own life. And who gains from that? It's not God. It is Satan. That's He wants to kill and steal and destroy each of us. So I accepted the Lord on December 17th, 1999. Two weeks later, I'm driving down the highway, going to work on the 27th of December. And I, I looked in my side mirror, and when I look back, I'm driving towards the sun. A very, it's an orange sun, but you can look right, at that moment. You can look right into it. And so I look to the left, and I look back, and there was a glorious white cross right on top of the sun. And it was, I mean, the Holy Spirit was just going through me for 45 minutes, etc. Now that cross didn't last that long, and that because I, I don't know, it seemed like couple minutes, five minutes, but when I looked again into my rear view mirror and looked back, the cross had vanished. It didn't dissipate slowly. It had vanished. I know it was a, I guess, a vision from the Lord and his, his filling me with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So that empowered me to believe the word through my, um, Maybe darker moments when Satan is again coming and trying to, you know, it's a remembrance. This happened to me, and I know it happened to me, and I know it was an, an illusion. Amen? So um, on on December 17th, I've been out there for a while, and I started going to church and so forth. And the first, I went to a United Methodist church first. The Lord even pointed it out to me when I was moving to this um, house. He, you're, you're to go to church there tomorrow morning. So it was a little country church out close to uh, Leesburg, Virginia. But it, but the um, as I go in there, I thought church started at 10 o'clock, and actually what it was, that was Bible study. So I walk into a group of eight or 10 men and women sitting around a table um, uh, studying the Bible. So when I walk in, none of them knew me and whatever. And when I sat down, they said, how are you? And I just unloaded all of my trash on them. And one of my dear friends who's passed away said, uh, we, we just closed our books because we knew we had a live one. So <laughs> the, and they did have a live one. Amen. And that day when the pastor, um, it was a, it was a female pastor. She said, uh, right off. She, and she wasn't looking at me, but I knew she was talking to me. She said, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're not going to heaven. You're going to hell. So I thought to myself, I'm going to go home and check the Bible and see what that says. Amen. Because that was a little between the eyes for me. So, uh, and thank God it was true. And thank God he continued to lead me and put men of um, spirit-filled men around me to nurture me and to encourage me through some tough times that came after that. But when I say tough times that came after that, and I hear people say, oh, it's so hard to call, to follow Jesus. I mean, it's all I can do is not to say, well, in actuality, it's a lot harder to follow the devil. Amen. So the, um, I guess that kind of brings us up to my having, um, received Jesus as my Savior, and he has been faithful and true to me ever since. So after after I got saved, Holy Spirit said to me that I, I discovered Christian music, some, you know, kind of uh, uplifting, aggressive Chris, warfare kind of music, okay? And that was, that just resonated with my spirit, such as even uh, John saying, uh, prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. Amen. And he was exhorting people, get your lives right, because the deceiver is waiting on you, and he will do everything he can do to trip you. And that's true. So I I examine everything. Obviously, I'm not perfect about it, but you examine everything to uh, determine, is this the spirit of Christ, or is this the spirit of Satan coming even as the angel of light to do, because that's all he wants to do is just trip you up, tick you off, get you out there on your own again, and turn you into some false doctrine away from the actual gospel. And I just also want to say it needs to be said without 
exception that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. It is true, even if you don't understand it or you have no explanation for it. I mean, like Jonah in a whale. I mean, that's hard to believe, but I receive it as truth. If you unwrap that, I mean, there are many teachings on it about the semblance of Hebrew being in the whale three days and three nights, and Jesus being in the grave three days and three nights, and then he rises again. Amen? Well, if if you don't believe in the true resurrection, that's what determines and gives us faith that we will be resurrected on the day of Jesus to be with him again. But, But these things are imperative to walk in faith the rest of our lives upon this earth. And I I just want to say, um, he put me into Christian radio after a year after I got saved. I couldn't even play two CD players on the air, but he put me into a one horse FM station and it all, there was, we, we were so in one regard, so unprofessional, nobody said anything. And when I say unprofessional, I mean uh, unskilled and really good, broadcasting and we were we used these cassettes to record download messages off the satellite and then when i came in in the morning i had to pull those cassettes and rewind them back to the beginning of the message and put them in other cassettes that they when the computer activated them they play on the air just like you hear you hear charles stanley or uh, adrian rogers and speaking of adrian rogers i love both of them but Adrian Rogers, and we're in these times. He said, what used to slink down the alleys in the dark now struts boldly down Main Street, and it's everywhere. So I just want to, um, I never will forget him saying that. So after three years of uh, working, and I became manager after three weeks of getting there of the radio station, and which was of God, there's no way. I asked a guy when the manager, when he called and asked me, he never even met me. When he called and asked me, I said, is anybody else here being considered for this job? Because I wasn't going to take it in ahead of anybody else. He said, no. So I took the job and that's when also I didn't hardly know how to use a computer other than check my AOL email. But anyway, so that lasted for three years. Then a, the stepson of the owner had put his son in as president of the board, and the son was a very, um, he, wa- he wasn't saved, and he hated his stepfather. And so he ended up selling the station that we had to an NPR um, affiliate, National Perverted Radio. So we, um, I lost my job there, or that was the end of that. And the Lord had told me 2003 when the Iraq war started to get ready because he was going to send me to Iraq. So I just, I'm all in agreement. And the, and the very, not the very, um, I'm very happy with the fact that during Vietnam war, I went in the air force because I certainly didn't want to go in Vietnam as a Marine or in the army because I mean, I was scared to death. Fear controlled me. So when he said I was going to Iraq, and I had gotten radically saved, I believe. He removed the spirit of fear from me. And fear is a, fear is a spirit. I don't care what's coming at you. Um, it comes in to stampede you and run you in the direction of there's no hope. Amen. So when I went to Iraq, the Lord, the Holy Spirit said to me, you will not walk around here or or. Um, duck around like you and show fear to these troops. You are, you either believe me that I will protect you or you don't. So I had, I had a beige body armor and I, on that body armor, I had, uh, Psalm 91 written on it. And there was a verse out of Deuteronomy where it says, the angels of the Lord shall encamp around those who fear the Lord. Amen. I had that on there. And so, uh, the, the troops, I got along pretty well with most of them, but there were one or two that were, um, they were, well, we all know it. They don't want to, they don't like anyone that's filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. I mean, the spirit in them hates the spirit in us. So, but other than that, then when we get in a Humvee to go out, I would say, um, I would pray 
in the Humvee I was in. And some, and once, once I was even asked, sir, by a uh, sergeant, I didn't even think like me. He said, sir, would you lead us in prayer? And so I always close my eyes when I start prayer and then uh, open them up as I'm praying to see what people's reactions are, etc. And when I opened my eyes, every one of them was on his knee, looking down, holding his helmet. But when you're in a war zone, um, uh, fear can come over you. And especially, you know, we let our mind go wild or what we saw yesterday, which is kind of like, as far as I, my experience is like PD, PTSD. And the Lord gave me a, for that acronym, he gave me a new phrase, praising the Savior's deliverance. Amen. Because he delivered me through, but the, um, but the Lord used my lack of fear in situations there that I know and know full well were an impression on some of those who fear was trying to take over. We had this kid, I was riding next to him, he wasn't a kid, he was 20 years old and he's a soldier in Iraq, but you could tell he was shaky. And so we get in the back seat of a Humvee together and the radios are squawking back and forth. So I waited to pray and we were, we'd were we gone about a half an hour, half a mile or a mile. And, and the young man looks at me and said, aren't you going to pray today, sir? <laughs> I said, in just a minute, I am. So there was many uh, and a um, young man who had lost his best friend in an attack on a fob. The Lord said, go up on the roof up there. He was in a a machine gun desk on the corner of this building. And I went up there and he's angry. And I said, what's going on? And he said, why did my best friend have to get killed? Why couldn't it have been somebody else? And I, and I ministered to him the best I could. I don't remember what I said to him because it I, actually it was in the spirit. And many times we don't remember what to get said. So I just want to say this. Um, God has delivered me through PTSD and contemplating suicide to have those thoughts no more. And remember this, those thoughts come from Satan. They are not your natural mind con contemplating that and coming up with it. They're thoughts that Satan puts in our mind is to take our life, egg is on and edge is out. You have to resolve yourself to hold on to the, what the Bible promises. They are promises, and if you believe them, God will not dishonor that, and he will not fail you. He will not fail you. That His word is dependable and faithful. And I just want to say that I know that my I was really seeking holiness in front of the Lord all of that time and believe in the word of God so that when, if you want to, it's like me walking in Iraq. Could have been killed. Several journalists were killed. I was there as a freelance reporter. Several of them were killed. But the thing is, this one guy, he got three purple hearts. He said to me one day after patrol, he says, uh, you ready to go get shot at again, sir? I said, I'm not, I said, I'm not getting shot at. I rebuked that. I said, matter of fact, you want to hang close to me today. So, so the, and another guy said something. I said, they couldn't hit me with a bazooka at 10 yards when God has his hand on me. But when you seek holiness and you you believe what the word says, that gives you confidence to walk into places that are um, could be fearful. It would be fearful. I'm not a brave man, but I believe God's word. He brought me through a carotid surgery. Turned out my carotid was 99% blocked. I was going blind in my left eye for three, four minutes. Then it happened two days later. And then I said, well, I guess I better go check this out. And it turned out the, so, um, they said it did a CAT scan, said it was 90% blocked, scheduled surgery two days later. After surgery, I asked the surgeon, so you say I was 90% blocked? He said, oh no, you were 99% blocked. We could hardly get the scissors in there to, split your carotid. And then three weeks after that, I had a pretty bad blood clot in my thigh, left calf and ended up with a blood clot in each side of my lung. And the doctor comes in, he says, I think, I think he was Islamic. He said, you're very fortunate man. I said, I'm blessed by Jesus. He covers me. I just want to encourage you, bear down on your faith, bear down on the word of God, 
make sure you're reading a, I'm just going to say it, there's a lot of translations out there that kind of sugarcoat what my favorite is New King James. I'm going to plug that, I guess. But I learned, you know, the just make sure you're reading a good word that gives you a crisp meaning on the gospel. So I would encourage anyone that is in a rough place, uh, repent and draw nigh unto the Lord, which I'm going to emphasize with this about three weeks ago. I'm seeking God's gifts. I'm seeking them, not because for my glory, but because I'm sick of seeing people who are caught in bondage and are very dismal in their life because they don't have any hope. Or maybe they have hope, but they don't think God is going to do it for them. So I'm seeking God to lay the gift of healing on me steadily. So I was in a fast for nine days, and the, and the Lord just showed me all the— He was on me like a dental hygienist, peeking out all these little things back in it I didn't think were a big deal. Well, praise God. And let me also say this. When I got saved, he delivered me from sexual lust. I was never into pornography, but he delivered me from sexual lust, lusting. I mean, just lusting. So the, and it was, it was immediate. Now I do have to guard my eyes and make sure I don't get drawn back into that because I, sexual lust is a flat out adultery. It's, it's not a, you know, you hear people say you can look, but don't order from the menu. Well, that's all a lie. You cannot look, God, because we are lusting in our heart. So in, I encourage you to inspect your inspect your thoughts, inspect your ways, and live according to the direction of the Word of God, and your life will have peace in it. Amen and hope. Lord, we just come to you this morning. We, I, I lift up all the military personnel of this nation, all of those who are fighting to um, safeguard us and our homes and our families, Lord. We thank you for their sacrifice. They are sacrificing life and events in their own lives that we might be free. We ask you, Lord, that you will lift them up and protect them, that you will touch their hearts with the word of God, that you will give them confidence beyond understanding, as I think you have given me, Lord, or even give them greater confidence, Lord. Honor them and bless them, Lord, and turn events around in their life. And any of them that are going through um, threats of divorce or divorces, we just pray your blessing upon their homes and a realization that these men are serving us and women. It's not just men. So we ask you, Lord, that you will touch each of them, Lord, and that we will, even in ourselves, will turn from rejection and turn from um, selfishness and self-centeredness, that we will be more loving and more kind to our spouses and to our children, Lord, that they will be carried through and shown the spirit of the Lord in these military people, Lord, and that they will be shown grace and mercy in their own homes, respect and loving kindness. We ask you, Lord, that you would cover each of these with a hedge of your protection, that no weapon formed against them can prosper in any way, and the lying tongue of the devil and those who serve him be cut off in Jesus' name, that they will only believe the goodness of God and not the wickedness that is prayed against them. And also, as um, I read a book about PTSD in 2003, this man who suffered from PTSD and you had delivered him is called Nam Vet. Uh, Chuck Dean is his name. Thank you, Lord. He wrote that as the soldiers were coming in and out of uh, the air base, being brought in country and taken out of country, that there was a Buddhist uh, temple at the end of the runway and that those monks, among other things, prayed that uh, vets would be filled with a spirit of anger and that they would never find peace in their hearts, Lord. We rebuke that right now in Jesus' name. We ask you, Lord, that you will lift them up and you will make 
warriors out of them. I just want to, and I just want to relay this vision that the Lord gave me in 2003 as I'm going through this. He said, he said, I'm going to lift up Vietnam vets into my mighty special forces. And though they may have fallen back in years prior, they will, they will stand in the face of death, even unto death. They will serve me, saith the Lord in Jesus name. We thank you for that, Lord. Anyone can take hold of that promise. It doesn't have to be a Vietnam pet vet, but that's where the Lord had me in those times. So I just ask you, Lord, bless us all. Raise up your warriors, Lord. Raise up those to love you and bring forth the mighty army of the Lord as we await your return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.